Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Nicolina Todlek, an oncology nurse from the University Hospital Center Rossi, Croatia. And I'm joined today by medical oncologist, Professor Shelko Kumal, who is the clinical director and chairman of the Interdisciplinary Breast Unit Clinics of SNMITE in Germany. Today, we'll be discussing the application of antibody drug conjugates in breast cancer. So, let's start our first section by talking about individualizing treatment strategies with HER2-directed ADCs in breast cancer. HER2-directed ADCs are a promising strategy for breast cancer. HER2 is cell surface receptor that plays a crucial role in cell growth and proliferation. The HER2 protein is overexpressed in 20 to 30% of breast cancer cases. In patients with breast cancer, Amplification of HER2 is associated with increased risk of recurrence and poor overall survivor versus HER2 negative disease. These observations, together with cell surface accessibility of the HER2 extracellular domain, prompt development of HER2-directed antibody-based therapies. Trastuzumab is HER2-directed monoclonal antibody, frequently utilized in HER2-targeting ADCs as a vehicle for selective delivery of a cytotoxic payload for HER2-positive cancer cells. There are two EMA-approved HER2-directed ADCs for breast cancer. One is trastuzumab emtazine, TDM1, and the second one is trastuzumab deruxetan, TDXD. Trastuzumab emtazine is a cytotoxic DM1 molecule. Trastuzumab deruxetan, called TDXD, is trastuzumab monoclonal antibody with cytotoxic DXD molecules. HER2-directed ADCs in clinical development are trastuzumab duocarmazine and dizichimab vedotin. Now, Professor Kumal, let's discuss some questions submitted by our audience about HER2-directed ADCs in breast cancer. Can you explain the mechanism of action of HER2-directed ADCs? First of all, the mechanism of action is, I think the engineered ADCs um, are designed to detect and bind to the HER2 receptor, as you explained, on the surface of the cancer cells. And following the attachment, the ADC is internalized via the uh, mediated, receptor-mediated endocytosis. And after the entry, the ADC is trafficked to endosomes and lysosomes and enzymatically which um, of the linker issues. And then this cytotoxic payload, the payload is actually the, the chemotherapy is released into the cytoplasm. And it's like a Trojan horse model, what I'm talking sometimes, to release it into the cell and so the cell killing potential is unleashed. And the apoptosis to the target cells. And what we have to difference is probably from TD1 to TDXD is that at TDXD we have additionally a bystander effect and what that means. And the pivotal feature of the ADC is in the bystander effect as the liberated toxins can permeate and exterminate neighboring tumor cells that may not express the target uh, antigen and therapy, increasing the anti-tumor effect and both is outside of the cells and after apoptosis, maybe release of the maybe chemotherapy to destroy or kill the other tumor cells. And this is a really additional important mechanism and maybe can explain the efficacy of the newer generation of these ADCs. My second question from the audience would be, where do HER2-directed ADCs fit into the treatment algorithm for patients with breast cancer? First of all, is if we have an HER2, we now we have to call it overexpression. That means that the IHC of the immune chemistry must be plus three, or if it's so plus two with an additional amplification. Then we have the approval of HER2 low and maybe now the data of HER2 ultra low. So in that time we have to separate an HER2 expression with low plus one plus two no amplification and an overexpression plus three or plus two and an amplification. And these both situations TDXD is approved from the FDA and from the AMA. TD1 is only approved in early breast cancer situations and metastatic or locally advanced breast cancer situations if we have an HER2 overexpression. Well, what we know is that the TD1 is the adjuvant treatment of adults with HER2 early breast cancer situations with residual disease in breast cancer or lymph nodes after, and this is really important, near adjuvant taxane based HER2 target therapy. 
And this is the first trial, the Catherine trial was the first trial to show us that we have to treat an early breast cancer situation, the patients near the one, because after the result of the surgery, so they make the chemotherapy prior to surgery, if we have the surgery and if we have the result of the surgery to say there are some rest of tumor cells in lymph nodes or in the breast, then we have to change the therapy to TDM1 is more effective. And the, these data we have from the long-term follow-up of the Catherine trial. So this, that's why we have implemented near different strategy in early breast cancer disease. If we look at unresected or locally advanced or metastatic breast cancer who previously received testuzumab or taxanes um, separately or in combinations, patients should have either received prior therapy for locally advanced disease or develop the recurrence really early uh, within six months of completing the adjuvant therapy, which means mostly the antibodies may be trastuzumab or pertuzumab. Going to the other side of TDXD, the newer generation of ADCs, um, of, we have the approval of the adults with unresectable metastatic HER2 over, uh, overexpressed positive breast cancer who receive one or more prior anti HER2 based regimens, that means from the second line situation or adults with unresectable metastatic HER2 breast cancer situations who receive prior chemotherapy in the metastatic setting or develop disease recurrence within six months, completing adjuvant chemotherapy. So that means HER2 low is a different situation, and most of this data from this new four we have for endocrine or HR positive disease patients with HER2 low signals, then we can use TDXD uh, as I mentioned before. I was wondering, how do you take, talk to your patients about expected outcomes associated with HER2-directed ADCs? And what data supports this discussion? I think the patient is not interested in number and, and, and the name of a trial. The patient wants to know how efficient is the therapy for me, how, what are the side effects in the situations, and all the th th things that we can talk about. So we have to be empathic, we have to be personalized for these patients. I think I open this, if you maybe look back decades from that one, we have, I think, not that much to do for these patients. We only can tell that maybe the prognosis is not that nice, etc. Now we have this targeted personalized therapy where patients use these drugs over years. And if you start your conversation with these situations, and that's a day to, take, to tell the sentence, I have a lot of patients taking these drugs over years. I think this is a really important sentence for a lot of these patients to say, I, probably I have the chance to get over years on this treatment, etc. And then we can talk about, because we have to try it, and talk about how is the efficacy in that situation. The next one is what I'm going is to tell about the side effects, what we can use for that patients, maybe what we are going specifically, what we have to keep in mind where we are focused on that one. And then the patients have a complete picture um, to say maybe to go on this treatment. TDM1, I think was the first huge success, the Amelia trial, to say maybe the second line standard therapy of cafecitabine, lapatinib versus TDM1. And if you look for that one, I think the hazard ratio is with 0.65. What that means, if you read the hazard ratio, 0.65 means that we have 35% better survival if for the new drug. And if we prove that at the Amelia and said this is a high efficacy, always the question raises, can we cure more patients if we use it in the early breast cancer situations, in the curable situations, and how we implement this new drug most successfully? And so I think the practice changing trial is the Catherine trial, as I mentioned before. Two standards are practicalized for that one. First of all, we learned we have to do it near the one, to give the chemo prior, then make the surgery. And if we have in PCR, non-PCR situations, in case of non-PCR, pathological complete remission is not there, then we have to use TDM1, and we have a significant overall survival benefit um, with a long-term follow-up of over eight years in the Catherine trial. There's a hazard ratio of something around 0.54, it means nearly 46% better survival, near the one, rest of tumors, invasive tumor cells, treat the patients not with maybe dual blockade or testuzumab, treat the patients with TDM1. I think these are two practice changing trials. Let's look on the other side, how is the development of new ADC generations like TDXD? So at firstly it begins, as the number tells us, destiny breast or one. 
And I think this is a story and we never that never happened in breast cancer before. I think Destiny Breast One shows us such promising result that the FDA said this is without any com combina uh, without any control arm uh, to situations, but we only saw the high efficacy in waterfall plots in the PFS situation to say this gets an improvement um, that situation is following for Destiny O2 and then the phase 3 trial Destiny O3. And what is testing in that situation? It's testing, and I think this was a huge success, the standard TDM1, I told you from the Amelia trial, for the second line metastatic situation, to test if TDXD is better as the second line standard. 70% better PFS using TDXD as a new generation of ADCs versus TDM1 in this second line metastatic breast cancer HER2 overexpressed patients. So, and then once again, of course, now the story, but we can't tell us in the future if we have this huge success in the metastatic situations, we want to translate additional curable situations. Um, that's why we, we implement uh, TDXD and near adjuvant new strategies or post near adjuvant strategies in other destiny programs. What we learned with TDXD, we need only a small signal of HER2 on surfaces and then it's effective. And this was the Destiny Breast of 4 trial. So this is a short break and a, deep, a little deep dive about the, the practice changing trials what we have in the last maybe decade for her to overexpression and now to her to low patients in early and metastatic disease. How do you expect emerging her to directed ADCs to impact the management of patients with breast cancer in the future? Of course, now we, we talked together about TDM1. This was a huge success, maybe a decade before. Now we're talking about TDXD with complete destiny program, starting with destiny 01, going to 2, 3, 4, for maybe her to low, destiny 06, etc. And now we have to talk about newer generations because the story goes on what I'm telling. I think the development in that situation is to create new ADCs, it's coming more and more. Now we can create in laboratories, we can create with computers, etc., the newer generation of ADCs to simulate the, the payload. The payload is what we explained before is the chemotherapy, to make two payloads probably in that situation, to change the antibody, to change the surface situation, to change the linker. This is the cleavage between the, the, the payload uh, and, and the antibody. And to focus on that one more and more and get more and more. So what we see is that the newer, newer, newer generation of ADC is coming more quickly than earlier. Um, and it's coming more and more. And the end of the story is always for our patients. We have more and more successful trials with new, maybe changing of standard of care because new efficacy or higher efficacy of this ADCs. Probably in this testing is there's, like you mentioned before, testuzumab, um desitumab, vedotin, or maybe some drugs only with numbers and, and, and letters like RX788 uh, in that situation. And this is, I think, to a promising story what I'm telling my patients too, that in more lines of, of the therapy that they are coming, we get every months new data to implement it and to have new drugs. And now we can create in laboratories, we can create with computers, etc., the newer generation of ADCs to simulate the, the payload. The payload is what we explained before is the chemotherapy, to make two payloads probably in that situation, to change the antibody, to change the surface situation, to change the linker. This is the cleavage between the, the, the payload uh, and, and the antibody. And to focus on that one more and more and get more and more. So what we see is that the newer, newer, newer generation of ADC is coming more quickly than earlier. Um, and it's coming more and more. And the end of the story is always for our patients. We have more and more successful trials with new, maybe changing of standard of care because new efficacy or higher efficacy of this ADCs. Probably in this testing is there's, like you mentioned before, testuzumab, um desitumab, vedotin, or maybe some drugs only with numbers and, and, and letters like RX788 uh, in that situation. And this is, I think, to a promising story what I'm telling my patients too, that in more lines of, of the therapy that they are coming, we get every 
months new data to implement it and to have new drugs. Thank you very much for sharing your experience and important insights. Please stay with us for the next session. Welcome to our second part of the session. We are speaking about what to look out for, side effects associated with HER2-directed ADCs in breast cancer. The safety profile of HER2-directed ADCs is generally manageable, but adverse reactions have been reported. So very common adverse reactions and special warnings. For TDM1, um, very common is urinary tract infection, insomnia, peripheral neuropathy, hemorrhage, as well as the dry mouth, arthralgia, myalgia, and asthenia. For TDXD, the side effects are upper respiratory tract infection, neutropenia, leukopenia, lymphopenia, hypokalemia, a loss of appetite, also dizziness, the lung diseases, alopecia, lower ejection fraction, and the loss of weight. For both TDM1 and TDXD, uh, very expressed is thrombocytopenia, anemia, headache, epistaxis, cough, as well as dyspnea, stomatitis, diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, constipation, and abdominal pain, together with higher transaminases, musculoskeletal pain, fatigue, and pyrexia. We also have really special warnings and precautions to speak about and emphasize. For TDM1, left ventricle, ventricular ejection fraction, it's uh, lung diseases as pneumonitis, neurotoxicity, hepatotoxicity, and hypersensitivity on place of infusion. For TDXD, it's lower left ventricular ejection fraction, also pneumonitis, but embryo fetal toxicity. Adverse reactions associated with HER2 directed ADCs have been reported across multiple clinical trials. So for TDM1, and there was thrombocytopenia, decreased platelet counts reported, as well as the hemorrhage, and transaminase increased AST and ALT. For both of the TDM1 and TDXD, reported was left ventricular dysfunction uh, and infusion-related reactions, as well as hypersensitivity reactions, were reported for TDM1, and then the pneumonitis and neutropenia was reported for TDXD. Now, Sherco, let's discuss some questions submitted by audience about how to monitor for, mitigate and manage side effects associated with HER2-directed ADCs in breast cancer. How do you monitor for and identify side effects associated with HER2-directed ADCs? First of all, of course, what I'm telling um, the patients and maybe our, my, my team, etc., is we have to think that every different ADC had every different side effect. We have to learn about it. First, I think with the large experience that all of us have that, talking about TDM1. TDM1 is feasible and well tolerated by most of the patients. We have to tell the patients that we have platelet counts dropping, so maybe um, to have hemorrhage um, problems in that situation, we have elevated liver enzymes. What I'm telling is, my team, these are paper toxicities. What that means, because low platelets and probably elevated liver enzymes, most of the patients doesn't feel. So what the patients feel are pain, uh, um, et cetera, in that situations, neuropathy and this. So we have to tell the patients differently about the situations where we are aware of because of looking for blood reports and tests and the situations what they are feeling and that's maybe questions of vomiting, nausea, etc. So this is really important. So as I mentioned, TDM1 on one side. If we're going for TDXD, what I'm telling the patients beside the neutropenia questions, and of course, that's why we measure um, the blood uh, and we do the blood reports uh, probably every week at the beginning and afterwards, I think stretch it just a bit to, to think about it and that situation. But then we have to talk about, I think, nausea and vomiting and that situation. So we do with TDXD mostly or for most of our patients in the real world setting, we do with dual combinations of um, nausea and vomiting prophylaxis that we don't hear. If it's not enough, I think as you showed us before really nicely, we're going for lansipine probably. If you do, it's just a double or triplet combinations as prophylaxis, we treat most of the patients really well. And then we are talking about alopecia. TD1 has no alopecia, mostly problems for the patients. TDXD, 
if you don't have Skype cooling, it could be and an alopecia situations. We can't maybe what is the reason we don't know exactly if this is the half life time, etc. It should be just a bit in that situations or the more drug antibody ratio, as we explained in the first part, more efficacy, etc. In that situations. But what we learn with Skype cooling, I think a lot of patients they don't have a wake afterwards. What I'm telling this is the most successful situation. I think this is the difference what we tell the patients from TDXD to TDM1. And then we have, I think, of course, we have for both ADCs, we have the pneumonitis situation. I think for all drugs. What we tell our patients is really important to say. First of all, is stop the drug. The second is, please aware of this problem. If you have more cough, etc., please come to the hospital. Then we have, and then we have to tell our maybe fellows, etc., and residents, if the patient's coming in the hospital, we need the CT scanning to look at the lungs if we have the ILD, interstitial pneumonitis symptoms or signatures in the CT scanning. And what we are giving is then uh, steroids, corticosteroids, steroids, the patients to treat the patients well. If we do it fairly and quite maybe as early as possible, I think we can manage most of these patients quite sufficient. And this is important. Tell the patients maybe that they be, must be aware of that. Don't stay at home two or three weeks with cough and more and more. And maybe um, we think problems uh, at that situation come to the hospital to check it. And then we don't do really severe side effects, like it's mentioned. And this is what we learned. I think the different anti ADCs have different side effects. And so, uh, so it's, that's what I explain to my patients about the side effects, but we must be aware of that. So I think your really interesting questions is how to follow up um, the patients. And of course, I think the follow-up of the patients with her to overexpression treatment drugs is much more easier because we have the cardiac monitoring over maybe two years in a minimum, every three months to that one. That's why we see the patients. And we can tell, ask the patients, maybe what are the long-term side effects? Maybe neuropathy questions. Maybe is this is something to deal? But these are the long-lasting side effects where we have to monitor, uh, monitor that situation. Maybe cardiac uh, safety profiles and neuropathy as an example for that one. Thank you. That is indeed very important to emphasize to a patient when to react and who to report to. Sherko, what are the risk factors for key side effects associated with her to directed ADCs and are there ways to mitigate the risk of the side effects? Of course, maybe if we look at clinical trials, most of the clinical trials um, is a specialized, really selected population. So mostly younger patients, etc. If we have an approval and changing of standard of care, of course, we have older patients, uh, etc. We treat all the patients, and that's why sometimes we see, of course, different kinds of maybe fatal reactions, more side effects, and so we have to deal, deal with that. And we learn it's the second aspect, and maybe as we talked in the first part about clinical trials, if your team is managing in the clinical trial, I think the team knows the drug two, three years prior because the drugs come into the clinics after approval of AMA, FDA, etc. This is an important factor too. And afterwards, you're learning to, to deal with the situation as soon as possible. Um, maybe all the age patients could be a risk factor. Deal with neutropenia to focus on that one. Uh, make more blood counts um, to look at that one. Be aware of ILD to focus on that one, to see the patients. Maybe see the patients more often. It's much easier to see the patients too late in that situation. I think this is what we have to deal with. All the other situations like maybe cardiotoxicity, et cetera, we don't must be more aware than just be learned with her two directed um, um, maybe drugs as we learned um, in the decades before um, in that situation. Thank you for explaining that a good follow-up is really one of the key um, to get the side effects under control. How are key side effects associated with her two directed ADCs best managed? And when should adjustments to the treatment regimen be considered? First of all, if you look for TDM1, we have the, uh, maybe the blood counts and the paper reports. And that's why the, the, the doctors must be aware on that one. If we have a thrombocytopenia, we have to stop, we have to delay, 
we have to lower the dosage levels, etc. Maybe these are reactions what we have to do in um, that situation. If you have the rare cases, neuropathy, just again, delay, lower dosage level, maybe in some cases stop on that. We don't know, we don't have any drugs for, for maybe treatment of neuropathy or PNP situations. What we learned now, we have some specials of tape with capsaicin. Maybe it could be working. We have some strides with acupuncture. It could be working in that one. Um, I think this is, but we actually, in maybe that we have just a pill or tablet to say, um, to say this is something against neuropathy we don't have. If you have an ILD, interstitial uh, pulmonitis situations, lung diseases, I think you have to be aware of that one because this could be a reason to die for the patients. So you have to be aware and you have to be maybe in those situations, if you have a grade 2 ILD probably with TDXD, you can't go on with this drug. Yeah, that'd be it's an important situation because the risk of the patients who have fatal reactions, it's, uh, it's much higher in that situation. So these are the, the instruments what we have. And then we have the learning curve, what I'm telling, um, to the teams and to, uh, to maybe in my presentation. We learn with the drug. We learn, first of all, in clinical trials how to use it. And then we learn maybe probably for TDXD, if we have maybe more patients with nausea or vomiting, where we think, okay, that's just a bit m more than we expected for TDM1, what we can do. But we have a lot of new drugs that we can, can use, triplets, prophylaxis, or something like that. Please use it. Maybe if I think that you don't need uh, to come to nausea and vomiting. And this, what I'm telling mostly, um, if you know the side effects and if you know how to deal with that one, the most or the best situations is to do prophylactic, prophylaxis, then treatment. If you wait always on side effects and then you have the reaction, it's maybe not mostly the best part of that. Maybe if you see that maybe the patient has some problems with nausea or vomiting, Go with the triplet combinations as prophylaxis. If the patients do it well, I think you can go for two, maybe d double uh, combinations for nausea and vomiting. I think this is like what I'm telling my colleagues could be a good option to treat the patients. Thank you very much for explaining. It's really important information to emphasize both to a patient and to nurses to get insight and sufficient knowledge. So stay with us for the last part of the session. So let's move on with real world practice and optimal strategies for managing patients with breast cancer treated with HER2 directed ADCs. First of all, we have to talk about that we are a multidisciplinary team and this is essential for effective breast cancer care. We have the oncologists, we have the surgeons, we have oncoplastic surgery, oncology spe uh, specialized nurses, we have the breast care nurses, we have the pathologists as one of the key players, we have radiotherapists, radiologists, technicians, etc. We have primary physicians to work together with us. We have the pharmacists, we have psycho, um, psychologists, we have physiotherapists to do maybe dietitians, specialized persons. I think we have home care, healthcare teams, palliative care specialists and data manager. And this is coming all together with a team to treat the patients with breast cancer. And I think this is, this is necessary to treat the patients in all different af aspects of the situations uh, to treat them well. And breast care nurses provide a continuum of care throughout patient's breast cancer journey. So we have, first of all, the oncology nurses are the forefront of cancer care and can act as the hub of the multidisciplinary team, uh, what we are telling. And first of all, they have clinical support. I think patient's assessment, outcome evaluation, screen, for managing um, side effects, symptoms assessment, clinical interventions like wound dressings, aroma, aspiration, drain removal, etc. A lot of things they're doing every day. They have the patient support, disease and treatment education, support, shared decision making, like we did today, and physical and emotional support, psychological support they give them, and patient advocacy, health promotion, and counseling for that one. And then they go. A lot of this time for, for them is care coordination, like private patient provider point of contact, information sharing with the MDTs, coordinate diagnostic procedures, surgery, medical, radio, oncology appointments. I think this is a huge aspect to do this routinely for that one. 
liaisons with primary physicians, psychological services, dietitians, and social workers is important too to bring this together as a multidisciplinary team to bring this to the patients. And at the end, we have to talk about community support, like presenting to breast cancer patients groups, cancer volunteers, um, hospital staff, local high schools, women in the community, and breast cancer promotion. I think there's a huge aspect to be aware on all the situations what we can do with our patients now together. And that's why all of us, uh, we can never think about um, to, to treat our patients without our breast cancer nurses. And this is a huge success in the last decades from our breast cancer nurses. And from my personal side now, many thanks for that. Now, Nicolina, let's discuss some questions submitted by our audience about how to optimize the care of patients with breast cancer who are receiving treatments with ADCs in clinical practice. So the first question is, I have a 57 years old patient with metastatic HER2 overexpressions who has received two cycles of TDXD with a normal dosage of 5.4 milligram per kilogram. So she recently started experiencing treatment related nausea, vomiting, and reduced appetite, despite receiving antiemetic pre-medication. What could I recommend in terms of dietary adaptions to help my patients manage these side effects? We have um, different kind of recommendations. Ones are the general ones for all the patients, and then specifically if nausea or vomiting appears. For the general recommendations, we always recommend to a patient to have a high intake of proteins to maintain the weight because weight loss is very common. Also to have um, healthy meals. Try to eat five to eight times per day small meals so they don't have a full stomach. Also to drink plenty of fluids because this is really important to maintain the fluid balance. As well as to be precocious, it's important to eat fruits and vegetables, but also we need to emphasize to a patient that those fruits and vegetables, if they are raw uh, and they have immunodeficiency, they can cause infection for them, so sometimes it's best to cook those. If the patient already has nausea or he or she is vomiting, we recommend also to take small, uh, small meals more often. Also, uh, if the smell of the food they mind, we recommend if they have any kind of support, so Somal helps them cooking. The room temperature can help, as well as the temperature of the food. If they eat cold food, they will have less nausea. Of course, if the patient is vomiting, we will recommend that they don't force themselves to eat plenty of food, but maintain the liquid balance. Also, we recommend that it's easier to sit up or lie back when they have raised head after eating to help to reduce the nausea. And very important is a good oral hygiene because of size of tents, which is uh, very common with those kind of treatments. Um, and also they can have mucositis and different kinds of wounds and stomatitis in their mouth. So the sense of the food may be different if they don't do good oral hygiene. So my next question is, um, my patient with her to expression metastatic situations is due to start treatment with an ADC after experiencing disease recurrence five months since completing antiviral treatment. I think a high risk situation. What strategies you can recommend for nurses to help support this patient's quality of life while undergoing treatment with ADCs? It is very important to have a holistic approach to a patient, but also to a caregiver, because a caregiver most often has very significant role. So we look all the aspects of the care, not only physical, but the psychosocial support and the spiritual one as well. As nurses, we can support the patients very much as we are most often almost the first point of contact um, to discuss with the patient and to explain the side effects and support with the quality of life as well as their caregivers. It's really important to be open and have open on communication, to listen to a patient so we would be able to advise the further steps and how to improve the patient's quality of life, not only regarding the medication and side effects and the treatments, but also the different side which comes from non-pharmacological part and non-pharmacological support as to, uh, self, to do self-care, to do perhaps mindfulness training, 
and to communicate with us and to communicate with their caregivers because we are here for them to guide them through their uh, treatment journey. And my next question is, um, I have an ex-patient and uh, she is 53 years old with breast cancer receiving treatment with uh, her two directed ADC. She's keen to get back to work and resume normal life as soon as possible. How can nurses assist with social rehabilitation and support patients who wish to return to work? That also depends very much on the side effects that the patient has, as for instance, very common side effects is lymphedema, or depending on the treatment, it's alopecia. So it can be the physical side effects, we need to approach multidisciplinary in collaboration with nutritionists to remain good nutrition due to lose weight, to approach a physiotherapist, um, because the physical therapy can help really much to patient to um, feel less numb with the limbs, with the arm, have a smaller um, percentage of lymphedema so they can go back to their work and normal life because it's really important, especially for someone who works in uh, difficult physical uh, jobs. So also physical therapy may include stretching up, um, having a flexibility because sometimes due to treatments or the surgery that part of the arm is not really um, good and movable and it's really important to have compressed bandages to prevent lymphedema. So perhaps sometimes it's good to say to a patient if they do difficult physical jobs or they are not ready to return to work full time to try to speak to their managers and ask different kind of approach and different kind of title, role title at the moment. Except the physical well-being, there is also the psychosocial import which very important for the patient. If they decide to return to work, they, with good psychosocial and family support, they also may reduce feeling different side effects of the treatment as feeling nausea or feeling fatigue. With good support, they may feel much better and much happier. It's also important to include the patients and the caregivers in different supportive groups and connect them to psychologists, though that can sometimes be stigma, but communicating with people who have experienced similar uh, side effects, it might be really good. It's good to say that occupational therapy is really important in, the, in this kind of treatment and patients returning back to their normal life and different kind of te techniques that may have alternative solutions as well, adaptive devices and different lifestyle changes that are needed. So, and at the end, the question is, what general advice would you give to nurses to best support patients with breast cancer who are treated with HER2 directed ADCs? I would start off with educate. Educate yourself to be able to educate the patient to understand the importance and the side effects of the medicines, drugs, clinical trials, which you already emphasized very much. So to be able to help the patient and uh, manage good the side effects, it's very important to be well educated. The second, I would say the most important is communication. Communication to a patient with plain language that patient understands, giving uh, the written materials, but also the communication with the caregiver and the multidisciplinary team approach. So this is also one of the keys. Then the follow-up already mentioned, to follow up to a patient to explain who he or she can report to and what kind of side effects, what to take care of. Um, bear in mind the financial burden, the psychosocial support and uh, psychological status of the patient and their families. And I will conclude with support, support each other, support the team members, so we would be able to support the patients. Nicolina, it was a pleasure to listen to you, to get so many insights from you uh, and practical uh, advices for our patients. Many thanks for that. Thank you, Sherko. My pleasure was mine.